Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Director's Commentary. I thought I'd go right back to the uh, the beginning. Almost, well, it's the beginning of the Survivor Man series proper. I had done two pilot episodes before this, the winter and summer, uh, we called them Stranded at the time, uh, and then we, we, we released them later as Survivor Man episodes. Uh, and I'll be doing those for director's commentaries as well. But um, uh, this is ostensibly the beginning, no, not even ostensibly, it is, for in fact, the beginning of the uh, Survivor Man series proper. Uh, and I started where I knew I would be comfortable and where I could figure things out. Um, the first season was absolutely a learning process. It was, uh, you know, the beginning of a lot of things, and I had to figure my way through a lot of things. Uh, so... Uh, I, you know, everything from camera technique to storytelling to editing devices um, to what works out there and what doesn't uh, to the struggle of having to survive and film myself. Anyway, it's, it's all here. This is, this is the beginning of that. So let's get started with Survivor Man. Survivor Man. Can't even say my own series. Survivor Man, episode one. In the northern wilderness, ah, survival. Let's stop right there. <laughs> That's called green screen. Um, and it was a device used a lot in those days. Um, yet even in those days, I felt it was getting old school. Uh, I had a different editor at the time. You guys have heard me often reference my longstanding editor, Barry Farrell, who's I think a brilliant, brilliant editor. But this was before Barry. And um, the editor I was working with and I didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Uh, there was a lot of battles in the edit suite. And, um, he won a few of them, unfortunately, um, and I shouldn't have let him, but I didn't, uh, didn't know enough at the time. I was still learning uh, as, a, as a series producer. I directed, uh, done my own documentaries, but this was the first time as a series producer. So anyway, so this is called Green Screen, as you guys know it, and uh, ah, it was a way to kick things off. Wow, look at me. Am I ever young there? It can be the toughest plants that you can... I'm clean shaven. I forgot about that. Yeesh need around for only six short weeks after that if you don't hunt your trap you'll starve i'm going in in the fall when the rain and the wet snow can suck the life right out of you join me now for seven days of survival alone without food water or equipment in the remote canadian wilderness it's all about setting the stage in these days had to let you know what was going on and so this was the uh, not what I was for. Sort of a tease, sort of. And here comes the the opening. Now these openings um, are, have been replaced. Uh, these are not the original openings. I don't think. I don't think so. Maybe they were. I can't. I can't even remember. Because I know Barry helped me to clean these shows up quite a bit as time went on. So, but here we go. Episode one. The Canadian North is one of the most vast areas of Open with the map graphic, the planet. as always. The forest here, reaching from Newfoundland to the Rocky Mountains, is the largest tract of unbroken forest in the world. Every year, nearly 2,000 people are lost out here and have to face dangers ranging from... I can't remember where I go here. I, th I, think, I thought it was in Tomogamy. That map didn't show me in Tomogamy. But there were things that happened in those days. Here miles from the closest human being. I have seven days yeah, I'm sure this is, I'm into Magami, of course. Find my own way uh, out, there were things that uh, went on that, uh, in terms of producing the series, that uh, were battles I needed to have with editors, battles I needed to have with executive producers. It was only really in season two where I felt I had a grasp of doing this series the way I wanted to do it, which basically meant pure and absolute authenticity. It's not that this, these weren't authentic, they absolutely were. I'm still going through everything the same as you see it. But they, they were ways of doing things that, that um, were uh, based on TV production and uh, you know, sort of being pushed down that road. And um, after one or two times making a couple of mistakes here and, there, here and there, I thought, yeah, I'm not doing that again. I'm doing it my way. And with only one match. Ah. One match. That was the other thing. Right away, I thought, you know, I'm going to be doing a lot of these shows. Let's set the scenario. And I would do that. I would, I would think, okay, well, in this, what if I only have one match? I know what to do with just one match. Let's, uh, that created a thing, it created a way of saying, you know, what if, you, if you've got one, la one match left? It happens. It does happen. Let's go from there. Woo! Yeah, whitewater canoeing. 
I guided for many, many Canadian years. Canadian North is magnificent this time of year. Nights are clear and cold, and the bugs are all gone. And if you're lucky, you get to experience the first winter snowfall. I'd love to reward myself with a late fall canoe trip. Problem is, when you're completely alone, if something does go wrong, that's serious. No. All right. You can see go. I've still got, I've got a crew shooting me on the, at this point. So this was the introduction of having the crew there to shoot just my openings and then they're gone. And I don't know if I say it in the, um, in, in this episode or not. Um, if I didn't, it's probably because the network was saying, no, don't say that, you know. But then it's faking it. And as you guys know, I wasn't about that. Yeah, love paddling white water. Many, many years of my life spent in a canoe paddling rapids like this. So this was actually a lot of fun. And it came right out of the real scenario. Oosh. Even the most experienced paddlers that was cool. can be hit with the it can't happen to me syndrome. So this little scenario here, I mean, it was obvious that um, plays out time and time again in the north where, where people uh, are out on a canoe trip and dump their canoes, wrap the canoes, lose the canoes, break the canoes. And it, it was an obvious and easy scenario for me to set up uh, as my first ever Survivor Man episode. In most cases on a river like this, Canoe can be gone for days downstream. Camera crew leaves me alone now, completely okay. alone. That's right. So I did get that point across, and uh, that was important. I'm soaked to the bone. It looks like it's going to rain. I have hair, almost. And sun's about Not to much. Set. Seven more days. The first thing I have to assess is my situation and get my head straight. The decisions made after an accident like this often define whether you're going to survive or not. Now, look at that. There you go. There's the first ever selfie stick. Um, I, I had that built uh, by uh, the North Bay Canoe Company. I, brought, I had one of their canoes and I had uh, the man who ran the company put that together for me. And this was the beginning phases of filming Survivor Man. Um, I'd done the two pilots before, so there was a lot of experimentation there, but it was all about uh, getting myself mobile and, and being able to carry the cameras that I have and hold the equipment. And so this was this big tube bar, put the camera on the end. No one was doing anything like this in broadcast television uh, or any other kind of filmmaking at this point. Um, so it certainly gave me a niche to occupy. Um, and a unique way to film. This was the beginning of, of a unique way of filming things that nobody else was doing, and so I had to make it up as I went along. And as a result, necessity is the mother of, of invention, and there was a lot of things I tried to invent as I went along. This was the first, I wish I'd patented it. It's the hikers that often, or, or lost hunters that often, have panic set in. They don't think about making a shelter, they don't think about uh, sitting down and staying calm, often what happens is they just take off and they start going pretty much as fast as they can to try and get out because they're, they're, they're certain that just around the corner is going to be the trail that they lost or the road or their car or wherever the parking lot, wherever it was they left to go on that hike. Generally speaking though, they never find it. Yeah, it was, I, I've, I've got that point across a couple of times, you know, the panic, the feeling because there's a big monster chasing you, though. That's, that's the feeling. And uh, All right. I'm just going to camera. stop this right here. Um, it, and that is the thing, you know, and I've said that on, I think I said it in the Sierra Nevada episode and the original pilot here. You just have that fear, that panic. I, I chose over time to repeat the odd bit of information in case people hadn't seen a previous episode because it still mattered. It still mattered that you know that the first thing you need to do is calm down. But that's not the first thing you do. You panic. That's the first thing we do. So, uh, in this case, uh, there it was again and uh, just pushing through the bush, you scraped, you get cut up, you get bruised. So now, um, this next little segment was all about, and I did this for, for a season or three where I, where I just like, I always wanted to lay out everything that I had I, after a few years, 
it just became a thing of, I'll just tell you. you. You guys trust me now. I'll just tell you. You know what I'm doing. So, and I, I, didn't, need, I didn't need to waste uh, a lot of uh, viewer time on laying out all of the things that I have in my pack. But this was the beginning. Camera gear. And it, it certainly helped Cheated to tell the story. You could visualize and right go, oh, and that's all he has. Tape. It's one thing if I say I only have this, this, and Inside, this, but it's another thing if you look pants. at it, because it doesn't look like much. Spare fleece is going to help. Oh, yeah, my hat. So I'm not sure why I don't have a second a angle going on here. Oh, yeah. So there's, there's the stuff. There. One match and a Swiss Army knife. We've got a great discovery over here on this side of the river. This big flat rock is going to be a great spot for me to get a huge fire going to try and dry out. Uh, the, uh, the good news is that oh, it's yeah. not raining yet. The bad news is, is that it's snowing. Oh, yeah. I'm wet and it's snowing. Um, this was the episode that I had experimented with a number of different cameras. I think I had a Panasonic, a Sony, and JVC, and all of them small cameras, and I used them. And it was an editor's nightmare because, uh, in technical terms, they all operate on different codecs. And when I got them into the edit suite, the color balancing, and just the different codecs, it was a nightmare for the editors. And so I learned from this episode on, always have one brand of camera. You can have three versions of the Sony, or three versions of a Canon or a Panasonic. I actually had a Canon on this one as well. But um, having, you know, trying to match up a Panasonic and a JVC or a Sony and a Canon, nightmare. I learned that on this episode. Very much. It's I didn't want it to be snowing on this episode. I thought, oh, it's going to be all right. And then, like, oh man, the cold weather started to come in. I better get the fire going soon. This big rock area in here might make for a great shelter area if I can build a big fire all along here and reflect the heat back to me later in the night. This guy's a little bit in the way. Would have helped a lot more if I'd had an axe. Gathering firewood without an axe, not easy. You're reduced to pretty much a lot of small wood. It takes a lot of gathering. It's very true. You know, there's a lot of uh, firewood. Okay. That, um, actually, you know what my favorite is? Time to not so much an axe, up but one match. a saw. Saw, a small well, hand saw. Dry. It's amazing in a survival quick. situation because you can get a lot. You can get to the center Success of a lot of with my one dry only match. firewood with a saw and an it's axe been over is just an hour since a lot more work. I fell in the water and I've remained soaked to the skin ever since on this cool autumn day in great danger of hypothermia. Oh, first butt shot. You know it took me I can't remember if uh, I think the network now my job is just to keep that blurred that out when they first aired it. I don't know if they still do or not. I think they I think they did. Maybe they still do. I don't know why. It's not a bad butt. It's not going to be a warm one. Uh, that scene of, of uh, drying myself done. off naked like that. Um, as a filmmaker, I, you know, you do this as a songwriter, as an author, as a filmmaker. You reference things that you've been influenced by. And really, I knew what I was, I was referencing there. That was right from the film Never Cry Wolf, when the main character, uh, I think Charles Smith is the actor, uh, falls through the ice. And there's that naked shot of him drying off. Uh, it's a good scene. And you know what? I got to do it anyway, so let's film it. A little bit of an homage to a, to a wonderful film. If you haven't seen Never Cry Wolf, get on Netflix or whatever it is you're watching on and, uh, and check it out. Maybe I'll see if I can get the rights to it and put it on SMTV Network. Guys down, I'll just sit here and wait for it. I'll then push all the coals up against the big rock, take all these boughs, put them down, and sleep on top. I love this method the, uh, of heating a flat rock, moving the fire over at nighttime, sleeping on top of the flat rock, on top of boughs. It actually can be too hot, very, very much so, uh, on, on many occasions, but not at 3 a.m. Around 3 a.m. it's like perfect, and you need that, and you can sleep much better, even if it takes a while to sort of get on top. So you end up staying up a little bit later, but once you're on there, it's nice and warm. It's a great method. I it's, it's a classic, traditional sort of mountain man method of, uh, of, of sleeping at night and, and, and to go to another movie. Uh, Jeremiah Johnson, great scene. Nice warm bed, basically all the heat from the rock coming up through the boughs. I call it my Jeremiah Johnson shelter. There you go. Now, actually, it's not a shelter at all. Uh, should have put more 
I forget what he said. Should have put more 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 bows down. Saw it right off. Great scene from Jeremiah Johnson where uh, Robert Redford jumps up because he didn't put enough covering over top of the uh, the coals. They were sleeping on the coals. Um, that's right. Didn't put enough dirt on the coals. That works too. But if you've got a big flat rock, it works better. If the wind picks up or if the rain comes down heavy or wet. Actually, a tremendous survival instructor, Larry Dean Olson, was the uh, the um, consultant for Jeremiah Johnson. And if you're looking for good survival uh, work, uh, check out Larry Dean Olson's work. It's uh, classic. Or wet snow. I'm a long wet night. Yeah, so chill me to the, bone beauty, the beauty of this shelter, but it you're warm. The danger, I'm faced with the danger remote Canadian if it wilderness. rains, you're not covered. I just heard something big crack. Coming up. There's the little coming up tease. I was forced to do those, so I kept them short. Here we go. Oh, yeah, this is the green screen. So I'm watching this on the DVD version that uh, you can get on my website. But, I mean, now you don't have to because you can watch these on, on the SMTV network. Um, the, again, the green screen was my editor's idea, way of telling the story. And uh, I didn't like it so much, but here it is. It was older, older school. What I worry about the most for surviving in the fall in, in that. Plus, I thought, you know, you see me in green screen, you see me all cleaned up. And to me, it was a way, it, it removes you from what was going on with me in the wilderness. And I didn't like that so much. Kind of bush, number one would be hypothermia. You're, you're often wet and chilled to the bone. It's wet snow and rain happening a lot of times. But the hidden concern is the fact that it's the rutting season for the bull moose. And in my opinion, that time of year, it's the most dangerous animal in all of Canada. And, and that is definitely a, a worry for me. Okay, uh, this is pretty much how I spent my night, like this. Uh, actually, the the boughs and the on the ground and, and heating the rock up like that worked really well. There's that, the, the the rock is actually still warm to the touch, uh, and uh, so I was pretty warm for about the first three hours, maybe or something. After that, though, even with the warmer ground. Without having any I'm trying to watch this while cleaner's running a vacuum just on the other side of the door inside. If you're listening to some buzzing, that's what you're hearing. Thing over top of me, it just started getting pretty cold. Fortunately, it didn't rain. It's a... Uh, I just heard something big crack. And this, you can't plan. There she was. What an incredible sight. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm trembling. Yeah, she's just, she's literally, with that camera shot, she's literally just on the other side of this little tiny bit of water here. That's, that's not zoomed in. I'm completely trembling right now. I feel a lot better now that I saw that it was that's a cow moose. I'm trembling because had that been a male, bull moose, in the rutting season, of which we are in the height of, and I'm in major moose territory, <laughs> is hands down, the most dangerous animal in Canada, bar True. none. They're absolutely an insane creature during this time of year. 1,500 pounds of absolute rage. And I have been chased and put up a tree before by a huge bull moose during the season. And she's past my camp, but now I'm going to be wondering who's on her trail. Yeah, and that's because, a story uh, you've, uh, if sure you've ever, I think uh, when I was on the Not too far behind her. George Strombolopoulos show, um, on CBC, I think it's uh, online, I'm you can get, it's like, get uh, best story ever. Les Stroud, best story ever, you Google that. It. And it's and the I full can, story it of um, being but chased right up a tree now, by a moose. Just uh, up about 20 feet or so up the hill. You can just feel the temperature just different. That's the vacuum. And graze. And, uh, Sorry, guys, good. we are at home together watching this. A good shelter spot. Um, and uh, that whole story about being chased up a tree by a moose. I mean, I was actually out researching locations for other, to teach some survival. Um, uh, to a group that I had to do the next week. And it was years before Survivor Man. And put up a tree. It's just silly. I called out to the female. The bull came running out of the bush at me. 1,500 pounds, or I'm guessing, of course, but massive rock antler. And uh, chased me through the forest. Okay, I'm going to hang on and wait for this friggin' vacuum to stop.
Yeah, you guys watch the show for a bit. Check this out. That's not bad. Not bad at all. It does feel warmer up here. There's rocks there, there's sand. It's a little damp here. Not gonna be comfortable. But uh, it's gonna work. I'm gonna put all these rocks, make a fire pit. So I can have a bit of warmth. That's under the assumption, of course, that I can make a fire without matches. And I'm up for the challenge. Every location is different, but if I'm to survive seven days in Canada's north in the fall, shelter is a high priority. It's always been a big thing in survival, you know, um, uh, whether or not to make a... Oh, actually, sorry, there's a little incidental survival instruction here. Hang on, watch this. You're protected from getting hit with the branches that breaks. A lot better than jumping on it. In the north, an axe holds the same importance as a machete does in the jungle. Without one, survival is extremely difficult. These spruce boughs. It's tough and it can be dangerous. That method for breaking a really branch nice in between thing. two trees is a pretty, it's, be it's a much safer enough. method uh, than you know, to trying to jump on a branch. A lot of guys try to jump on branches to break them. Very dangerous. And, on, uh, well, and so, at this way I've got some protection. That was just a good little way like of to, uh, saying, you know, let, let, here's what you can do. Just find some trees the right distance the apart. In, so do the break that way. They're nice and smooth like this. You don't really have to. You can just throw them on. But this way, all the rain sort of goes with the flow of the of the boughs. Even if I can't get my fire going tonight, at least I'll be a little more comfortable in here and a little more protected if, uh, if not warmer. <laughs> And that's where, like, in the these to... situations here, you know, it was um, tricky because, uh, and I've said this, this is why I'm, I'm, I'm loving having the instructional channel on, on SMTV Network because I'm able to get into the details of shelter construction. Go check out that clip and you'll see what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, because, you know, you need, you need hours, uh, you know, and even that distilled down into, you know, 20 minutes or I don't know how long that clip is. You can't teach a shelter in a few seconds. And, and a lot of times the things I wanted to teach on Survivor Man, you know, I had to get, get it over with within 120 seconds and get on to the next scene. It's hard to teach things really specifically. That said, I did the best I could to be as detailed as possible. Get yourself a nice sharp edge just to uh, smash the rock. This is dangerous, though. End up. Getting it hit back up in your eye or something. Well, let's see how this goes. Nope. Sorry, so anticlimactic, but nothing happens. It's climactic. There we go. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> I think I might as well use my rock and I split open here because uh, it'll extend the life of my knife and not dull the blade. That's why also if you can get fires going without matches, even when you have matches, means you'll have matches for that much longer. So this is a cedar tree. All I want is this fluffy, fluffy cedar bark here. It's good fire starting tinder. When you take the big chunks of bark, it's too, co too coarse. But when you scrape like that, it's very fibrous. And uh, think of it like a cotton ball fluff. That's oh, what man, you're trying to go for here. That will catch a spark a lot better than something solid. It's a green screen. There are places you can go where the need for fire is lower on the list of priorities. But in the Canadian wilderness, especially in the fall, fire is right at the top. True. So with just one match and a very wet season, I mean, that didn't last very long, um, you, you're left with just trying to rub sticks together. That's a classic thing, rubbing sticks together. The fire bow is obviously an adaptation that enabled us to be uh, much more efficient at starting fire than the handrail, which I'm pretty sure I do on another episode, so we'll get to that. I made a decision. It was either add a lot more onto the shelter, so then protect it from the rain, which looks like might be coming in, or uh, get a fire going, and uh, I opted to try for a fire. Let's see, so I will probably always bow. opt to try for a fire, um, Which is because a, a, a big fire going can be kept going and even in the rain. And uh, you know, to build a shelter, and I might stay dry out of the rain, but I still would be very rock. cold in the middle of the night. So it was vital for me to get the fire. So, but that's that's what happens when you're alone in a survival situation. You can't divide your time between things you need to do, so you have to pick your battles. Oh, man. Guess I should have practiced this one at home. 
I've only ever seen this done. Yeah, bottom line is I picked the wrong fungus. Oh man, this is useless. <clears throat> okay, I know somewhere out there there's some wise bush guy who's saying, oh, come on, it's easy. See that method, and I've talked about this before. You see, I'm, I'm, I've got, um, I'm trying everything there, but when I take the boot off my left foot and I go barefoot, I'm, I'm able to actually use my foot like it's a, you know, like a, a gorilla hand. You know, um, I can manipulate the uh, baseboard and uh, with my my bare foot, and I can't do that with a boot. So I often do my fire bows with my left foot um, bare, even in the winter time. Um, I'll do that uh, so long as I'm not stepping in the snow. You know, this is working, but it's killing my toes. Uh, I'm gonna grab some cedar. Now this method I'm more familiar with, so let's, uh, let's try it. Put a little hole in here to start off. You know, it spins pretty good. Oh, that's better. You gotta know hours are going by while I'm, while I'm doing okay. this. Oh, that's nice. That's a good, good sign. But you see, it just scatters all around the top here. And uh, it's got to have a place to go. All that dust has to have a place to collect and form like a little ember. So I'm going to cut a notch in the side. Sort of V. There we go. Uh, this is where, obviously, a Swiss Army knife or a multi-tool. I like the Les Stroud multi-tool. Uh, I think it, we called it SK Engage. Uh, it is really good to have that little tiny saw for, for fireball baseboards and cutting. That little tiny saw is, is vital. Helps a lot. Now here we go. I think that's cedar on cedar. Can't remember. Once I see smoke, it's my signal to keep going, not to quit. And I have to remember to breathe. I've got to give it all I can and then carefully stop so I don't knock everything flying. I encourage you when you try on your fire bow, try it with a bare foot. If you can get used to it, um, uh, you'll find it a lot more comfortable. And as I said, you can manipulate, you can, you, yeah, you can just manipulate the, the baseboard while you're working on it. I don't think there's anything more important than getting my fire going during this damp, cold season. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm still learning how to narrate and uh, what kind of voice I should have, you know, because I'm reading that, you know, after the fact in the studio sort of thing. This looks good. This looks good. Little tiny guy is all I need. You can always see me shaking when I do this after I've been working hard at it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. See, I remember this edit. I remember um, the editor did a few cuts here and there, and I and I kind of argued with them because I, I didn't want any cuts in the in the edit. I wanted you to be able to to see the process all the way through, and even if it took a little longer, it's more dramatic, you know. Plus, you see, you know, I'm not I'm not I don't want to suggest this, but you can see that I'm really doing it, uh, and that was always important to me. If you watch a lot of other survival shows and you watch the whole fire starting things, half the time you don't actually see the full action beginning to end because Sometimes they can't even do it. Um, and I was always, it was always important to me to, um, as much as possible, show that. On occasion, um, you know, I'd, I'd look up, oh, battery cameras will have stopped, things like that. It did happen, but for the most part, I wanted you to see it top to bottom. And you understand, too, how long things take. Ooh, I better move the spindles out of the way. Oh, crap! Shoot. Yeah, see, this is a this is really a talk about panic. A thing. Got no wood ready. You know, uh, so often you'll you'll I concentrate so again. much on getting the uh, getting right, the well, fire boat to take, getting a fire going. You forget to have fire wood ready. There's two classic errors: having nowhere near enough tinder, small stuff to nice to get high, the fire going, 
Uh, and then the other one is not having enough or having any firewood ready to take the bigger flames once you've got the fire going. Both those things are drastic errors. And you've got to make sure you've got all that material ready to go before you attempt to uh, get your fire going, even if you're using it lighter. All the way to uh, the other shelter. So, yeah, and that was a good way to do it, you know work on my fire on the flat rock and the open where I can really get at it. And then once I've got a great base and great fire going, just simply light something, pick it up, take it into where the shelter was and might get that fire going easily. That was interesting. Oh, yeah. I tried to make myself a torch to take to the shelter. Got to be a little too much. I'm gonna have to try that again. Cause I gotta get a fire over the shelter See? somehow. Little mistakes you make. Thought no big deal, I'll walk with the fire, and I was wrong. Sorry I didn't bring you with me on that one. It's just too much work trying to carry the fire and the camera at the same time. Before it gets too dark, all I'm going to do now is gather some firewood. Lots of it. Doesn't that look a lot more, a lot, lot cozier than... Uh than uh, sleeping out on the rock. The rule of thumb is, look at your firewood pile. When you first think you have enough, then make it five times bigger if you want to make it through the night. There's nothing worse than running out in the dark. You can see the struggle that I'm having there. I mean, you know, having to uh, get your firewood in the night and break branches at night is an extremely dangerous thing. Think about the injuries that can happen to your eyes, and so I've always taught that. I uh, was Survivor Man that just get loads and loads of firewood. You think that's well, enough? Night, Good, right. now times it by five. So then it'll be enough. Try that. Shelter. Try that math. It, it always plays out that way. Too quick and I ran out of time to cover over the shelter more, but uh, it only rained just a little bit, so I wasn't too bad off. And uh, even with my feet getting pretty cold, just being able to warm my face and hands up by the fire or turn around and put my feet by the fire made a big difference. Now I, I better get this shelter covered over some more so in case any foul weather does come in I'll be uh, I'll be protected I have to start thinking about food I'm not sure in why I didn't do Canada, any night shots that night before other than the gathering of the firewood because I usually plants. always do I might have just been that, exhausted and slept if you don't hunt or fish you'll starve any bit of extra little bit of sustenance I can get is going to be helpful and here's some uh, some yellow wood sorrel hmm Got a lemony taste to it. It's just a delicate little plant. Grows around wet areas like beaver dams and swamps and moist woods. In the west coast, you can find um, huge patches of, of the yellow wood sorrel. Massive. And they're big, too. And you can just kind of feast out on them for quite a while. I don't know if this is true, but I've always done it. I drink a lot of water and mark my territory all around my camp. And hopefully it'll serve as a signal to bears passing by that they shouldn't come in this area. So... Case in point about a television production, that little bit of goofy music that played there and the little diddle diddle when I went, was a battle that I lost and I shouldn't have lost. I should have said no, because to me it's just cheese ball. But I could be fooling myself though. Yeah. Finding a piece of See, that's what reality TV does, right? They put in those silly sound effects and uh, the guy I was working with did that and, and um, didn't like it so much, but the uh, it's all, it's like it's, it's on the same track as trying to overly be overly dramatic about something as well. But that technique about peeing around the perimeter of your your shelter uh, is a long-standing technique. Does it work? Who knows? Some say it might even attract predators, um, but I think the majority would suggest that uh, the smell of human in a circle all around your shelter is something that uh, can help to ward off, uh, you know, a cougar or something like that coming in. They come in, they smell it. And, uh, and they, they think, oh, nope, you know, I don't, you know, human, I don't, I, w I want to get out of here. That's the idea, anyway. Birch bark like this is great. If you just cut down the center of it, you can take it out, open it up, and you've got yourself a nice shingle, which is going to help to get some of the, get, keep you from getting wet. This is actually a good place to find uh, grubs and worms and things that uh, you can throw in the stew pod if you want. But uh, maybe you can also find grubs and things for bait, carpenter ants and uh, big juicy creepy crawlies. Cook them all up in a nice pot of water and you've got some sustenance there. 
I've heard I've heard it that uh, there are um, there were oh, woodpecker. There are uh, guys who have uh, frat parties. Oh. Uh, that they got into um, uh, Survivor Man, and uh, they would do uh, and and frat Survivor Man drinking parties. So every time I said something like uh, sustenance, uh, they would uh, uh, take a shot. Kind of proud of that. Well, that's the last thing I want here, even though I want to be warm tonight. That's not the kind of warm I'm talking about. So I'm going to have to make use of some of the dirt that's here and pack this in and put some a bigger rock, a couple of big rocks there to protect this whole underside from catching on fire again. You gotta remember that, man, what I'm making here is one big gigantic tinder bundle. Just staying alive can be dangerous. You know, that's really the case in point of what's going on there is it's, it, when you're in a survival situation and you have a shelter, then a you are constantly um, upgrading the shelter, adding to it, building long. on. Um, because again, so this is here, this is longer term survival that I'm talking about here. Oh, I'm doing a figure four deadfall. Rodents, like Forgot about that. Around, uh, and so in longer term, when you're location, not going home the next day, um, the then uh, you some you have to plan you know, for the future. And so so it's about that always that being proactive. And you know what? The more I add on to that shelter, the warmer I'll be at night, the better I'll sleep. And then the better I sleep, the better I can think. All right, we go. If I can get this to hold. Good old figure four deadfall. It's like a little hairpin trigger. Ah! Damn. Okay, so this part's a little too big. Try that again. Come on. Decided to make a hole. New set, smaller, and I get, grabbed a different rock too. One time, my friend and I uh, set out a whole bunch of figure four deadfalls around a uh, an industrial plant. Ow. Uh, <laughs> last thing I want to do is break a finger. Ow. Ah. Let's try this again. So that's kind of what it's like setting up figure four deadfalls. Anyway, we caught a ton of today, mice. And I definitely uh, got pretty good at doing thumb. it too, but. Doesn't look like I'm so you know, good here. Only a pinched thumb, but out here every injury is magnified because uh, it's just that much more discomfort you've got to go through when you're out here. Whoa! I forget to put the bait right on the stick before I lay the trap, so now I have to lay it all around. This could turn out to be a foolish waste of my only food. Yeah, see, that's a classic mistake in well, doing a figure four deadfall right now, or different traps that involve bait. That, uh, is forgetting to put the bait on the trap and then you want to do it after the fact. What I should have done or could have done would have been best. A lot of times you don't have to put big globules of bait. It's better just to have the, the, the scent. So uh, uh, I'll just let it run there. All right. These lakes and ponds will start to freeze over for the winter. That water was cold. Right now, it already feels like they're cold enough to Anyway, where was it? Oh, yeah. Setting this figure four. Uh, so you actually take the bait and bite it and chew it in, uh, in your mouth and then spit it all over the, the, the end of the stick you want to put the bait on and coat it. And that way, whatever is coming in to get it comes in and has to, it smells it, so it wants the food and it has to work at it and it affects your, your, your trap. Uh, whereas... A lot of times you put actual big chunks of bait, they just get stolen and sometimes they'll take a piece and if they get that one piece, they're gone. Even if there's a little bit more left, they're gone and you missed your chance. So you do that instead, you chew the bait up in your, in your mouth and then you put it on the end of your figure four point I, uh, or whatever I'm, type uh, of trap you use. My body, my core temperature has uh, dropped pretty, pretty good because of uh, being in the water like that. With just the, without any food energy in me now, I'm I'm just getting, I just I'm I'm losing my energy. I don't have the wherewithal to bother trying to cook this thing up tonight or in any way. Maybe tomorrow. Besides, sun's going down, and I got to get another big pile of firewood ready to make it through the night. That's the thing with you know is. is once you get into your second, your third day of survival, it's the, the, the lethargy okay. that gets you. 
It's the not I'm having boiling it. of energy. You just, you know, you do one thing and then you need to sit Whoa. down for 20 minutes and catch your breath again. And you do another thing, sit down another 20 minutes. It's really like that. Winter, you run you out of energy pretty so fast. What am I saying here? In the summer, you've got some, some, you know, working room there, some forgiveness. But in the fall, it can turn cold on you like that from a beautiful sunny day. And you can get into real serious trouble if you're not prepared for that. Very true. Ah, breakfast. At least these are pretty safe for me to eat. I'm hoping they'll just huh. be bland. Let's and give check and see what footage we have of what right happened now. that night. I'm sure I've got stuff. For whatever reason, we didn't show it. Kind of feels like a room. You'll notice in, there's not a lot. You don't see the other camera a lot in these first episodes. That was another. That was an argument I won, mind you, that I uh, had back in this t day. Was um, It was about uh, whether or not to show the cameras, as they call it in the, in the television world, breaking down the fourth wall. Or in Deadpool, breaking down a fourth wall within a fourth wall is like 16 walls. So anyway, uh, as I was saying, uh, breaking down the fourth wall. But it was important to me that you realized that all the time that I was filming myself, that I was completely alone, and I knew that that would reestablish it. That would always connect that in your mind. Oh, look, yeah, he's filming himself. My editor was trying to, to edit it, you know, uh, without showing any of those cameras. Like, no, you can't show the cameras. You can't. It's like, no, you can. This is, this is something new. Nobody else is doing this. This is a new show, and this is the way I'm doing this. And, of course, I did win that battle and, and have ever since. Uh, but it's important that people see, oh, yeah, the guy's got, like, all these different little cameras kicking around. Marshmallow. So he is really alone. This Ooh, was a mistake. Hope it tastes like one. You know, I've had these before, but I don't know where I went wrong with this tuber. Other than, yeah, other than I just didn't cook it long enough. Oh, God, that's horrible. Oh, okay. <coughs> Let's try boiling it. <coughs> Whoa. Pfft. I'm going to try and soften up these. Oh, hadn't cooked it at all yet. Maybe kill some of the flavor by. Ooh, stuck to my glove. I so, in these hot the old boiling, the old boiling in the hat. Um, and, uh, Basically trying to boil the water in my hat. And I knew I was probably going to do this. I did this in the pilot as well. Okay, that um, hat is a heavy, heavy cotton, I think, so it's holding the water. That, okay. that hat is a purposeful hat. I know that it'll hold water. Um, you just keep doing it. And that's the thing is sometimes you know, your clothing, your, your you gear, you always want to think about it as double duty or triple case, duty or quadruple duty. You know, whatever, whenever you have something that can be used for something else, it's vital it in a survival situation. Bitter, There's my tasting. bandana, which covers just my just head, which filters water, which keeps the heat in all sorts of things. So um, that hat was, oh, uh, there's a shot with I'd all the cameras okay. in it, like I talked about. But not so that hat, um, shelters, I'd always specifically chosen as, as one of my survival hats because I knew all day. I could collect water with it. So that. double duty. I really need food so I can function. Oh, wow. Oh, it's still bitter, but not as bad, I guess. It's also a little softer. Oh, I got to get this into me, though. I'm starving. Yeah. Shouldn't have used the phrase, hungry. I'm starving. I wasn't starving, yeah. but I was, you know, get some maybe technically I was. I don't know, but I was definitely, get you know, when you start going a couple of days, uh, just, you need this energy. And um, the tubers, oh, when oh, you can find them, oh, like yeah. cattail, it's a good amount of starch. So it's a big, big pickup, and that's what I was hoping for here. It doesn't even look good, though, does it? And trying to get the camera set up to catch this next scene well, was fun. Down, must come up. It's like it was just when you know you're going to throw up, but you're stuck in a car, or you're in the house and you're not near the bathroom the or something, and that's sort of, sorry about the butt shot. I didn't mean to shoot it like that. I just had to, I couldn't, I had to keep, I had to go. And uh, I hate the thought trying to get the camera anything, set up so that I could shoot that scene was, all creatures are fair game. boy, not fun. I uh, see what I just said there. I talked about, um, and I've thrown this in in a number of episodes and taken a little bit of criticism for it too when I was saying, um, 
you know, I hate the thought of, of taking the life of something, you know, but the reason why I said that is because I know in the end I'm really, I'm just shooting a TV show. Uh, not look, I, I, I eat meat, I'm not a vegan or anything like that, and I've, I've hunted and fished in my life and, uh, a lot and, and, um, and, and trapped and snared and so on, and, and I'll eat what I capture, but when I'm in an actual out there situation, then I'm sort of like, oh, okay, well, I, I need it, you know. Um, and I did for this, I guess there was just a bit of guilt in me that I was still doing it for television and not, whereas I put myself in this position, I wasn't caught in it. Um, nonetheless, I knew that I could teach you about what you can eat by taking a lot of, you know, lives out there, be it the squirrel in Utah or what have you, um, that I normally wouldn't take, I would just enjoy. And uh, anyway, that's when people got like, oh, you shouldn't talk about that, like, don't be a pussy man, you just like, go out and kill a deer. It's like, oh, you know, back off, dude. Like, this is just me being uh, an honest individual. Uh, I'm here to teach survival, you know, and that's what this is all about. Escargot, anybody? It's, uh, it's not squirrel meat, but uh, I wish it was. But at least it's, uh, it's gonna be better than bondle tubers, I can tell you that much. Let's crack one of these guys open, see what we got here. This is the true reality of, of survival meals, is it's a lot easier to get a lot of little things than one big thing to eat. What are we going to jump on the back of the moose and, with, a, with a spear and, and, and bring in the moose? Yeah, right not going to happen. There we go. How's that look, anyway? Ah, oh, just kidding. I'm going to roast it on the fire now, on a rock. All I need is some garlic butter. Now it's true that when you, when you uh, cook mm. uh, certain foods like that, you know, you might be, depending on parasites, you might be better off eating it raw to get more nutrition out of it. You when you see, cook it and you start to kill off, you know, you, you break down some of the nutri nutrition like factors. Um, uh, but it's not snow. That's a cold wind. even in real it's survival in scenarios, I've just always like found that you're better off to cook something if you can because it just makes well, you feel better. That and that psychological boost is just as important just as the little bit of calories you're, you're throwing into your more. body. Or, for that matter, the little bit of calories you've lost by cooking something. Thick snow as well. Here comes the snow. And like an idiot, I've got rain pants and I haven't been wearing them. They've been rolled up in my pocket the whole time. I'm going to go hide in my little shelter. Enough of this. Yeah, see, that happens too, you know. You, you go, when the rain comes, if it trickles in on you, you go a long time, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, and then you okay, realize well, you're soaked. My so, shelter. that I'm was not very smart of me. Good me preventative fire medicine would have been to I get the rain pants on. It's a lot easier to put a couple of big punky logs on that big outside fire and let it sit out the rain than to try and feed this one for the next couple hours. For one thing, it would just use up all my small firewood that I need in the middle of the night. So, uh, now I just wait. Here's one cold, wet fire. Nothing burning there. This is the worst case scenario. Cold rain. But, day five, um, that is a lifesaver, is knowing that you can find, we call it, I've been asked that before, you know, punky, punky wood, I, I, apparently it's some sort of, I guess it's a Canadianism, but, uh, you know, rotted wood, not soaking wet wood, but just that punky, soft, rotted kind of wood. You put a big massive chunk of that over top of a fire, um, it will smolder for days. And if it's pouring rain and you've protected all of your fire with a bunch of big chunks like that, all that heat is under there and even though it's raining up above, stays. And in that way you don't lose your fire in the pouring rain. It's a great trick that people don't seem to do. They just kind of give up when the rain comes in. But I've done it always and always I end up with a nice big roaring fire either in the rain or right after the rain when other people are like well so much for the fire you know it's all everything's wet now not not if you do that trick and doesn't look like any chance of breaking but look at this as I My said headphone. see it's still standing. they just came <laughs> and yeah. took the bait you so, know. Stupid, so the squirrel or whatever it was was able to come in and the take the, the little right cashews. I would have been better just to eat the cashews. And uh, it was a mistake. I should have chewed them and, and the, put them on the end of that, oh man, that and twig and the figure the practice, four deadfall. For. And that would have happened instead. With a squirrel underneath it. It's been about 48 hours, I think. 
of uh, non-stop rain. I haven't filmed, I haven't done anything. I, I just huddled in my shelter and I saw Yeah, that's always been a challenge for me, you know, is when weather breaks in on a Survivor Man episode. And I've said before in interviews and such that um, I always wear the two hats. You know, one hat is as a filmmaker and one hat is as a survival guy or a guy, you know, trying to survive. And sometimes that guy trying to survive wins over the filmmaking. And often it's when the weather is bad. And I just hunker down. There's, there's only so much I can show you on camera at that point. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, that's just the way it's been for me out there. You know, I might be there for the seven days, but um, or the three days or the 10 days, but, uh, but I'm not always filming. Sometimes I'm just surviving. Hmm. I still need some garlic butter with them. Okay, so that's it. Two snails, three cashews today, and a little bit of jerky. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, I'm just, uh, just raring to go. You know, the funny thing is, is even those little tiny bits of food, at least for the moment, at least for a little while, maybe an hour or three, you do feel, when you've got nothing and you take in a little bit, you pump up really it's like whoa I got lots of energy now you know, and then it, it fades quick to stay or go is made for you like what if you're a hundred miles from oh, this is important from anywhere and you know there's no way of hiking out other times it's just a very critical decision that you uh, you simply must make right in the beginning am I gonna stay am I gonna go well you know can I stay is there a place is there a way of getting food around here uh, holy mackerel it just keeps getting, it's like the forest is closing in on me here. Um, you know, can I get food? Can I make shelter? Is anybody even going to come looking for me? Uh, heck, does anybody even know I'm gone? And uh, am I able to, to, to move around? Uh, am I capable of, of traveling? These are all important questions you've got to ask before you make the decision to, to move. On the other hand, you might make it out to safety before anybody even knows you're gone. Yeah, see, that's the thing, you know, that old standby of just stay put, I'm, I'm not entirely agreed with. Um, there are times when you're better to move on, and that's what I wanted to teach and point out, is that you have to make a very proactive uh, move, you have to decide, make a, an important decision. Uh, this is what led me to invent uh, what I call the three zones of assessment, which I get into in later episodes. Um, how do you make that decision? Well, you do your three zones of assessment. But one way or the other, you need to make the decision, and sometimes it's stay, but other times it's go. And so creating a default that says just stay put, I don't agree with fully. It makes some sense, but it's not always the right thing to do. There have been stories of people who perished because they stayed put. So that's the part that I, I balk against. I want to go. Due east. I've come to yet another lake. Pretty much hit it right at the tip end of it here. Because it's a long lake. It would have been a long lake to walk around, so... Good news is, there's uh, some treats for me here. It's not the right, right season, but uh, still helpful. Let's see what it's like. These guys, like in June, all down in here is actually quite fresh. And yeah. Fresh. This uh, points to something, too, that I get, you know, I'll get asked a lot, and it's like, oh, you're going to be able to just get so many blueberries, or you know, such and such is going to be there, you can eat all of those, like, uh, only like if you're there in the right season. you got to yeah, be there during that two-week period when the stuff is super ripe. But, uh, so this is a cattails. Cattails are delicious. It's already gone woody on me. But it's the fall. Not much chance of eating that. Nope. I can always use the uh, top end. It's good for tinder. It's good for stuffing for my so you see, I missed the period. If this had been it, June, that cattail would have been amazing, Stuff and I could have like, filled myself like up with a lot of starch spark to it or and sugars. I do like the cattail. Cattail is like I just hope this passes great quick. survival uh, I gotta go get plant. On. Here comes the cold. There is no ritual when you are uh, trying to get your way out of the wilderness. You're taking at whatever's coming at you, and if there's a ritual at all, it's just keep moving. So you're moving, what do you face with now? Ah, a swamp, great. Move a bit more, what do you face with now? An icy cold creek, great. So the ritual is just dealing with everything as it comes at you, you just keep going. 
Uh, I don't know uh, what episode we have on smtvnetwork.com, um, uh, but if it's the episode without the green screen, um, sorry about that. We tried to get rid of those. Uh, we didn't like them so much, but uh, they're happening here, and, and you'll, you'll see them as part of this uh, director's commentary. Ah, uh, yes. Crossing the screen. Oh, and another butt shot. Uh, important to show, nonetheless, because, uh, you know, people sometimes tromp through something like this. So I have free screen on my naked butt. And, uh, you know, sacrificing and getting their, their, their clothing wet when, in fact, it'd be better to, uh, to attempt uh, barefoot and keep everything dry. And I'm barefoot there. Yep, get on the other side, dry out, and uh, dress back up again. Much smarter move than than tromping through streams and getting your getting yourself wet. Take the time. It's gonna take longer. Sure it is, but staying dry is more important. Uh, good to take hold of right now. Grab what I can while I can. That's been back. something I've taught a lot in survival as we trek along. Uh, is is when you that. see something it's that's advantageous for survival, maybe even this birch bark. that you can carry. So like no, birch bark or cedar. I mean, I'm in a you know, fibrous cedar bark, so things I mean, like you that, that you can get a good fire going survive. with, let's say. But or food you can eat. You know, Grab it as you go. Don't, don't think that wherever you land, that. it's all going to be there ready for you. Part of survival, if you're traveling, is recognizing and spotting the advantages along the way and not passing up on them because you don't know whether or not you're going to need them later on. This lake is another story. It's a long... Thin lake, and it's right in my path. Probably go that way. I estimate at least two kilometers extra just to get around this lake. Man, it's windy and cold now. It's clear, but it's certainly uh, getting colder. In spite of how beautiful it looks. Yeah, this was, you know, Attempting to travel while doing Survivor Man was always a, 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 a tricky walking, thing. Walking, um, and, I uh, tried to travel as much as I could, um, but you end up, I, well, I ended up just traveling a lot and not, to pass. not, That's not happening. filming and a lot of skills that I wanted to teach. When the copycat so episode, the copycat series came along, um, which took a lot from Survivor Man, you know. For example, in, in the Man vs. Wild series, they, they did a lot of travel. Um, because it was all about, you know, getting Bear to jump around from this boulder to that boulder and they had a full crew and they would drive him over here to get this shot and drive him over there to get that shot and go down here to get this shot and it looked like, oh, he's going through the, this big long stretch. No, no, it was being driven to the different shots, places and getting the shots. Well, when you're actually doing the travel like I was, um, you, you're not taking time to stop and film all the stuff. You're living through it, for real. Uh, and, um, so I didn't travel a lot of times for the Survivor Man series simply because I knew I couldn't teach you the skills I wanted to teach you if I was just constantly on the move. And uh, that said, there, were, there was a time and a place for being constantly on the move, and when I could, I would. And then you'd see what it was like to deal with that rather than go from spectacular, you know, jumping point to spectacular point to spectacular point. It was like, no, this is just thick bush, just got to get through it. And like little mini hot water bottles. That'll help, that'll keep me warm, like on my back end here tonight. Well, the front's warm by the fire, the back will be warm by these rocks. It keeps snowing off and on, just little tiny light. light yeah, I showed that rock technique in, any, the, in the Survivor Man, the, the second episode, right before this in the winter one. Uh, and uh, that's a quick. technique worth trying for sure. Go Heating rocks carefully because river rocks will explode on you. But when you can warm up rocks and then put them, rocks! in against your back, I think that's going to be uncomfortable. Uh, when it's warm and you're cold, it's like, oh, kind of yeah. that, you're, you start hugging rocks to stay warm. Air. It really works. Look for me. Ah, full disclosure. So that scene there, that one spot there, that was a pickup shot I had to get later because um, my, I'd shot it, I went through it, I traveled, my camera crapped out. Um, 
and uh, or sorry, my camera had cropped out that day for, on a number of things, and I thought, oh man, I've missed, and I and I need to show how much I. Uh, so I actually went back, and that's what we call a pickup shot. Something that I outlawed later in Survivor Man, I would not do pickup shots because it, that's cheating. But in this case, first season, first episode, I needed to show the travel, so I actually went back. Uh, to just a, an arbitrary location and showed myself traveling through. So there you go. Uh, there's a little bit of full disclosure for you. Had to do what I had to do, but again, as I said, uh, as I got into the series more and got more control of what I wanted to, the story I wanted to show, uh, I outlawed that. You know, layering's been great, being like dressed in layers when you're out in a place like this because you're cold at night, but during the day you're trying to, you know, get, get out of here, get rescued or escape and uh, you overheat really quickly. So I just keep stripping down layer upon layer until uh, till, uh, you know, I'm comfortable and I'm not sweating. Sweating's the worst thing. If, it's, if I start to sweat, oh, it just makes the nights miserable because then you just get those chills, you know? And uh, that's not fun. Because you sweat, you die. Later on in one of these episodes where I say that, I'll explain the origin of that saying. Mm, something, uh, it's like another creek. No. Oh, hey, hey. oh, this is a a nice sign for the weary wanderer. Oh yeah. This, yep, it's a railroad track. So I didn't again come upon railroad tracks until much, much later when I did the fan episode with Joseph okay. McConnell. Okay. Well, now McConnell, I got a decision McConnell. to make. And um. Do you follow them? Here, this is important. Or do you keep going east because you think there's a highway over there? You could go up the railway tracks and be right around the corner from, you know, an establishment. On the other hand, you could be 250, 300 kilometers from the next junction. And, and, and maybe the, the, the place that's close is, is that way, and you go that way. In this case, my decision, I think, is, to, uh, is just to keep going. And see, that's an important thing, you know, when you're faced with that decision. It's like, wow, if you can be tempted by what seems like the path of least resistance. On the other hand, if you're not quite certain where you're going, then take it, you know, take that railroad track and, and hope for the best. Well, and, I am, uh, but I that knew that if I kept going out. in a certain direction, I would, I would hit um, you know, a road. Down, and for the sake of the story, uh, storyline, I wanted to stick to that. Um, and I, to be honest with you, again, more, some more full disclosure, I also knew where those tracks went. Uh, I knew that it, if I went north, I would eventually hit a town. But I wanted to keep going. I wanted to uh, to sh make that to point sleep, and say, look, I'm still panicking and having made a wrong trail, decision a road, railway route. tracks may not always lead you to safety. If you know the direction you were going in would lead you to safety, that's a tough decision to make. I had to face it in uh, Romania as well, coming upon all the logging roads, because I knew these logging roads just go on forever and end nowhere. And I'd be able to see it. Uh, so I wasn't expecting what I got at all. Hey, this is a good sign, a hydro line. It's not always that good of an idea to follow them though. These things can go miles and miles in either direction. And the thing about hydro lines is then go right up and over lakes and swamps and just keep going. And you can't. I'm just going to keep heading east. I got to stick to my guns. Carry yeah. on. Which is vital. Uh, it it's very true. Uh, you know, hydro lines, they, they go across lakes. Whew. So there, they, I mean, there may be certainly a lot of people hunt hydro lines and they use them as trails, but, but they only go so far. They're not necessarily your, your road to freedom. So, sticking to my guns. Now, I'm keep desperate. going. I just want east. to get out. I start making the mistake of letting myself get wet. I know the producers will be looking for me. Every time I come up to water, I just don't care anymore. And before you know it, my pants are starting to get soaked. A dangerous situation if I'm stuck outside one more night. Yeah, and think about it. You guys know. Okay, I've shot this. Yeah. I had to go back across the stream to pick up the camera. And then go back across again because I was showing you what I was doing. I was telling you that story. And there was a prearranged, you know, I gotta get out. If I can get out to the road, you know, pick me up there. And yeah, I had to walk back across the stream. Over 
pick up the camera, and go across the stream again. So I basically do everything three times to show you at once. But that was part and parcel of what I was trying to do, was show you the journey. Traveling's tough, as I said. I can hear the highway. Ah. Hear it. So we make it to the well, end. That's it. It took me so there was days, but I found prearranged I didn't panic, uh, I that like um, that I would be picked up, you know, this day out in this area. And my feet are freezing. So in this little scene here, when I get picked up. actually my ex-wife. Hey, thanks a lot. That's the extent of my acting right there. Hey, thanks a lot. And off we go. There you go. <coughs> that is, um, as I said, that's, you know, uh, was the beginning of it all. I mean, you know, you could argue the pilots were, but um, at this point now, it was, you know, it was called Survivor Man. Um, and, uh, and onwards I went. It was 2004, but it was three that I made that. Um, and uh, carried on from there, you know. All right. Wow. I need a drink, something to eat, pick up my energy, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, more director's commentary to come. Uh, do some more of the Survivor Man Bigfoot and the uh, Beyond Survival, and of course, some more classic Survivor Man. Thanks.